Professor Carol Atkinson. I am on, I'm on the CIPD Manchester Branch Committee and I lead the Fellows Forum. So the Fellows Forum is working on this event in conjunction with clearly Manchester University and the Work and Equalities Institute at Alliance Manchester Business School. And I'm delighted to say um, this is, I think, the third in a number of these collaborations and they've all gone really well. They're always fast, really fascinating sessions and I'm sure today will be no exception. So we're delighted to work in partnership with AMBS and the Work and Equalities Institute. Um, and the session, as I say, is aimed at fellows. So it is intended to be both informative and some delivery, but also some sessions where we work together in a safe space to rehearse and discuss some of these issues. So I'm not really going to take any more of your time up. I'm going to hand over very shortly to presenters, but I just want to introduce and welcome Dr. Cara Nung and Professor Karen Niven, both of AMBS, who work extensively in this field and have got lots of research to share with us, lots of their own research and ideas and other people's research as well, and are going to deliver what I'm sure will be a fascinating in insight, both into workplace bullying, but also, I think, really interestingly, into its bystanders. So not just the people who are bullied, but other people who this affects. So I'm going to thank our speakers and hand over to them. Thank you very much, Carol. And it's really nice to see everyone taking some lunch, some, some much needed some much needed lunchtime out to listen to workplace bullying and bystanders. Not, we're not gonna teach you how to bully, but we're going to be teaching you, teaching you some hopefully fascinating and helpful insights into how to prevent and better understand this phenomenon. So first, just a quick introduction about who we are. So my name, as Carol said, is Dr. Kara Ungen. I'm a presidential fellow in organizational psychology and my PhD focused on workplace bullying and understanding the role of bystanders, and I've published work in that area. And I'll hand over to Karen for a quick introduction. Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to the session. So yeah, my name is Karen Niven. I work as a professor of organisational psychology and the head of the organisational psychology group at Manchester. Um, my research is quite broad. It covers a lot of areas relating to people's relationships in the workplace. And one of the key streams of my research is looking at the darker side of people's relationships in terms of mistreatment and bullying in organisations. And along with Cara and some of the collaborators, we've been developing a body of research looking at the role that bystanders play in the bullying process. Thanks, Karen. So before I begin, um, I just wanted to thank everyone who submitted questions before, um, before the session, so when they were signing up. We just found out about them a few hours ago, um, so we, but we're going to try our best to answer them as we go along in our presentation. However, we just want to acknowledge that some of the questions are maybe outside of our scope of expertise, for example, the questions asking about legal claims and tribunals, but we will hopefully be able to answer or provide resources when we offer deliverables um, after the workshop. So we'll talk a bit about that at the end. Great. So before I, before we start with a mini lecture, I wanted to give some information on the scope of workplace, of the issue of workplace bullying. So here I've got two snippets from People Management, which is a CIPD publication, and the BBC. So these are relatively recent, as you can see, and we can, and every, every once, every couple of weeks, you'll see new articles popping about how bullying and harassment are very, very important issues in the workplace. And regardless of, you know, digitalization of work, work from home, trends or whatever it just seems like a constant with our working experiences so it's something that's very very important to understand and to tackle which i'm sure many most of you will understand already so before we start with um so before we start I just want to get i want to lay the groundwork and to understand people's um people's experiences with handling bullying in a professional capacity so I'm going to stop sharing my screen momentarily and I'm going to give you a link to a website. So one second, uh, sorry, one second. Um, yep, here we go. Sorry, sorry, I'm having some technical issues. Do you want me to pop it in? Is it the Menti? Yes, please. Yeah, for some reason it wasn't showing on my presentation on my, yeah. 
So if you go on www.mentee.com and enter the following code, so I'll type in the code in the chat for you can do this on your phone or on your desktop. Um, it will take you to a short, it will take you to a poll um, asking you some quick questions about your professional experiences as in workplace bullying. And I'll stop and share the screen to the poll right now. So we get live kind of feedback. So one second, I will go to that right now. Oh, great. You guys have already answered quite a few, quite a few have already answered, so I'll just share. Perfect. So we'll spend a few minutes. Um, we'll spend a few minutes. And if you are joining a bit late, you'll see the instructions on the top ribbon of my share screen with code. And the first question asks, the average employee in my organization knows about workplace bullying. So about 15 people have answered. So I'll give it a few more, maybe a minute or two, just so we get at least a quorum of responses. So there seems to be kind of, I guess, two spikes of people who think they're, oh, now, now it's completely evened out. People who disagree with the statement and people who agree with this statement. So we have about 18 responses, so almost half. Should we wait maybe 30 seconds and then see what the, oh, it's changed. I feel like I'm live commentating something right now. <laughs> okay. Great, so it seems that so it seems that almost everyone has um, gotten a response, about 20 out of 39, so maybe about 20 more, about maybe 10 more seconds. Karen's helping me keep track of time. So if I'm, if I'm a bit late, please let me know. Okay, so it seems we've had like a pause in responses. So should we move on to the next response? So if you, oh, some more, okay. So if we go on to the next question, so I'm not sure, so you should be able to be go to the next question in the, in the meter, is that the case? No, okay, uh, present, let's see. It's normally the case. Um, Then this one, maybe. Sorry, just uh, some technical issues. Let me just figure this out. Um, I think they've changed it since. So present. And then I think presentations. Okay. I think so maybe another, oh, sorry. oh, I was going to say another way might oh, be on, that people on. could kind of raise their hands as a kind of yes, no kind of way of responding very quickly to the next question as an alternative. Oh, yes, yes, yes. This, this is my low tech method. Yeah. <laughs> No, this is, this is not, it's, I've used Menti before and it's been completely fine. So I'm not sure what's going on here. Ah, here. Okay. I got it. Okay. So have, are people able? Yes. Now it works. Okay. I'm not sure what, what magic I must've done, but thank you for bearing with me. So share screen. Now everything works. So the next question refers to the resolution of workplace bullying in your organizations. So in your experience, it, it seems that most that the 11 ish responses indicate that most bullying situations are not resolved well within the workplace, which is actually quite interesting given that there was some, there's a bit more um, equal distribution in whether in people's understandings of workplace bullying policies. So that's something that's quite interesting to explore. No strongly agrees either. So we'll just give it maybe another 20, 20, 30 seconds to see what people to see what people think.
And I'll also be giving the results. So I'll be copying and pasting these, um, these bar charts into the deliverables. So you'll be able to maybe reference them in your work, or if you want to follow up on this information in your organization, you can use this as, as um, a jumping board. Okay. So we've had 21 responses. So I'm just going to stop sharing now. Thank you for your time and for your patience. Um, and now I'm going to be going back to the PowerPoint. So one second. We won't be hopping in between screens too often, don't worry. <laughs> okay, can everyone see my PowerPoint? Great. Okay, so now that we've, you know, warmed ourselves up with a bit of, um, with a bit of questioning about our organization's handling of workplace bullying, I wanted to give you I wanted to give you a very quick overview of what workplace bullying is from an academic and scientific perspective. And we hear the word bullying thrown around quite often and it's often used alongside other very similar terms like incivility, like harassment or discrimination, undermining aggression. But what, sets what is workplace bullying and how is it different from these other constructs? So the academic definition of workplace bullying defines it as the act of harassing, offending, socially excluding, or negatively affecting someone's work task. And it has to occur over, um, regularly, so repeatedly over, um, over a regular period of, of generally weekly. And the bullying has to occur over a prolonged period of time. Traditionally, researchers have set the minimum um, the minimum sort of uh, experience to at least six months for it to be labeled as bullying. It's also conceptualized as an escalating process. So what we mean by that is it may start off quite mild, but as the bullying progresses, as it occurs more frequently and over this long period of time, it becomes more severe and the target or the victim may become less able to fight back as this, as this behavior wears them down. And it wears them down to the point that they that the victim ends up in an inferior position and becomes the target of these system, systematic negative social acts. So what really sets bullying apart is this frequency and persistence over an extended period of time. We also want to differentiate um, between bullying behaviors and harassing behaviors. So workplace bullying is unique in that it occurs does not explicitly require, does not explicitly refer to dis, um, behaviors stemming from, um, from, stemming from maybe racial discrimination, age discrimination, gender discrimination. So it's not necessarily harassment, which in the UK legally refers to negative behaviors that are a result of um, protected characteristics like the ones I've mentioned before. Workplace bullying is generally seen as um, it may, it may have harassing elements, but in its core, it does not refer to these protected characteristics. And as we can see here, this is a, this is a pie chart um, sort of summarizing where the sources of bullying typically comes from. So this is from a large Northern European sample. And as you can see, a large majority, so about half of all, um, of all sources of bullying come from supervisors. That is supervisors, line managers, or leaders are usually the ones instigating the negative behaviors. But it's followed quite short, quite closely with colleagues, so about 42%. Um, and then a very small chunk of um, a very small chunk of perpetrators are subordinates, which as you can imagine, given the power, the power dynamics that are inherent in supervisor subordinate positions is quite rare. However, I've been told that in some cases, it can be quite common when there's a unique demographic dynamic. So I've been told that subordinate perpetrated bullying is actually quite common when maybe the subordinates are older and male and the supervisor is a younger female. So there are sort of intersectional reasons for bullying to occur. And this and dominance of um, supervisor perpetrated bullying actually speaks to the, how sometimes power dynamics may play into bullying behaviors. However, there are many cases where colleagues bully other colleagues. And 
you would imagine that these colleagues start off on relatively equal footing, but there may be a conflict over a task. So for example, a project disagreement or a disagreement over how things are done. And then this can escalate. So remember the escalating process of bullying being a unique characteristic, the, per the, co the task centered conflict will then escalate into personalized conflict. So it's about, so it's not about disagreeing over the task, it's disagreeing on the person. And then this escalates into aggressive behavior, full on bullying over a long period of time. And then it leads to often the, big, the target being so leave the fired. And imagine workplace bullying has a very, very detrimental effect on one's physical and mental health. So I've taken some quotes in italics from qualitative interviews of workplace bullying victims that you can read as I'm going along the slides. There's been a consistent, men consistent research showing that workplace bullying is associated with depression, stress, low mood, and decreased self-confidence. And in extreme cases, targets actually exhibit symptoms that are similar to PTSD or post-traumatic stress disorder. And this can eventually, unfortunately, lead to self-harm or suicide. This, of course, all these negative mental health effects will lead um, to physical, physical and behavioral changes in the target. So we had a qualitative there was a qualitative interview participant who said they gained 45 pounds because they use eating as a coping mechanism. And there's also been research in Finland say, um, suggesting that targets are more likely to use sleep-inducing drugs or sedatives. They're more likely to use them compared to non-bullied populations. And research has shown that you know, no matter how strong or quote-unquote resilient a part, uh, an employee is, bullying will wear them down, especially if it's over a long period of time. And research has shown this, and it kind of violates this idea of building strong employees through resilience training or mental toughness training. As one can imagine, if, so, if bullying is endemic within organizations, it can have large societal costs. So there was a recent study by um, by Klein and Lewis that looked at the cost of bullying in just NHS England alone. And they've conservatively estimated that it costs around 2 billion pounds a year. And that's not including, um, you know, more like a more difficult to measure things like a lost, like a lost productivity or lost connections. And these can take the form of, and these societal costs can take the form of early retirement, inability to work and um, seeking medical advice. Someone asked if um, someone asked if uh, organizations recruit bullies or if bullies become bullies in organizations, and it's a very complex question because there is some research indicating that there are personality differences, but the overriding hypothesis, overriding I guess theory within within our field is that there in there are characteristics within the work environment that encourages bullying and. There may also be social um, social phenomena like role modeling abusive leaders that lead to normalizing these behaviors. So I will now set I will now um, hand over the the mic to Karen, who will talk a bit about the newer forms of bullying. So um, thank you, Kara. I think that was a really great introduction to you know what bullying is and the kind of detrimental effects that it has for people and for organisations and why it's so important for us to deal with. I kind of wanted to change direction a little bit and actually ask a question to you, which is, does anyone recognise either of these pictures, so the guy on the left or the little penguin on the right? Um, feel free to shout out if you do recognise who they are. Okay, um, so the guy, oh, oh. Ooh, I can see something in the chat. Oh, no. Okay. Um, I think Lindsay raised her hand. Lindsay, do you know who they are? Yeah, the penguin is Linux or Linux, which is a computer operating system. And that's Linus who uh, created it. <laughs> 10 points to Lindsay. Um, that's exactly spot on. So that's Linus Torvalds, um, who is the founder and creator of the Linux operating system. Um, 
Now, if you're a non-technical person like I very much am, um, you might not know much about Linux, but Linux is basically a very big deal. It basically powers a huge amount of our internet, mobile phones, smart TVs, basically most of our kind of technology in our everyday lives. So this guy, Linux Torvalds, is an incredibly successful individual. Um, but the reason that we wanted to kind of introduce you to him is, Cara, if you don't mind changing the slide. Um, back in 2018, there was effectively a big scandal, um, which it basically came out that he had been sending his employees hundreds upon hundreds of incredibly abusive emails. Um, and he was actually forced to step aside from his position despite being the founder of Linux. So if you just skip to the next slide, please, Cara. Um, I'm not going to read out the examples because I don't really want to use this language, but these give you some examples of the kind of emails he was genuinely sending to the people working for him in his company, the people that he was obviously trying to inspire the best performance from. And I mean, the language that's used and the way that he is speaking to these people is kind of unbelievable to me. Um, but, you know, this is a, a very clear example of, um, of a bullying type phenomenon. Um, and what's particularly scary, I think, about this example is that although Linus was forced to step aside um, when this scandal emerged, within five weeks, he came back to his position, um, having installed an email filter, which filtered out swear words. So I guess the problem was totally solved. Um, so if we move to the next slide, please, Cara. Um, so the reason that we wanted to introduce you to this case is that it is a very, very clear illustration of what we would term cyberbullying. Um, and what we mean by that is just bullying that occurs instead of in face-to-face -face encounters over uh, you know, a virtual means of communication. Um, and I think, I mean, so much of the communication that we have in our working lives, even before the pandemic, was via email, video conference, not direct in person, that, you know, an increasing proportion of the kind of bullying behaviours that people suffer are probably cyberbullying. And especially in the pandemic context, when so many people have been working from home, the kind of importance and prominence of cyberbullying is, is only growing. So cyberbullying shares a lot of characteristics and similarities to regular bullying, traditional bullying, if you like, but there are some distinctive aspects to it. One of the things is that there is essentially a trail of evidence, like we've seen with the, uh, the Linux example, that you have proof that someone has done this, at least when it comes to forms like emails. So the acts remain accessible. Um, the good side of that is that there's a trail of evidence, but the bad side of it is if you're on the receiving end, you kind of have a constant reminder in your inbox potentially of how someone's treated you. Um, another thing that's quite interesting, I guess, about some acts of cyberbullying, such as via email, is that when you communicate online in that manner, say via email, the amount of cues you get, such as non-verbal communications, body language, facial expressions, they're quite limited. So that me means that the meaning of people's words is actually more ambiguous or subjective. Um, the acts are obviously more indirect because a lot of times this is something happening from someone who's in a different physical location to you. Sometimes the perpetrators are even anonymous, such as occasionally by social media, for instance. But I think one of the most important characteristics that I think we really wanted to highlight is the fact that cyberbullying breaches the boundary between home and work. So with kind of traditional in-person bullying, this is something that obviously occurs in the work context. And while that's absolutely awful, what it does mean is that when you go home, you still have your safe space away from that bullying. It's not that you forget about it, but at least you have some form of safe space. With cyberbullying, you can access, well, in pre-pandemic times, and most of us are working in the office and so on, you could still access emails, for instance, at home, social media at home. So your home safe space is kind of slightly infringed. And particularly when people are working at home, their home is totally violated through cyberbullying. So um, if we just skip to the next slide, please. So 
building on this idea of the pandemic context, actually what researchers have found in a, a bunch of studies looking at different national contexts, including Japan, um, Australia and other contexts, is that actually co um, during the COVID pandemic, bullying has actually increased. Um, and this may be due to a number of reasons. Potentially, it's essentially easier to cyber bully someone than it is to bully in person. And for people in certain occupations where they're dealing with members of the public, that problem is really compounded by the increased harassment that they've experienced. So all of that builds a picture really that Firstly, bullying is incredibly important to deal with because of the harm it poses to individuals, but particularly now more than ever, there's a real impetus to be developing effective interventions to actually try and prevent bullying or at the very least limit its harm. But what's interesting is that when you look at the evidence we have about interventions for bullying, the evidence suggests that the effectiveness of our existing interventions is surprisingly and disappointingly poor. So if we skip to the next slide, please, Cara. So what Cara and I have been doing in our research and some other groups as well is building on this idea to try and understand why is it that interventions are poor and what can we do that's different? And one of the things that is very obvious to observe straight away is that a lot of the research on bullying and a lot of the interventions on bullying really focus on this idea of two parties being involved in the process, the bully, or the perpetrator and the victim. Whereas what we and others are starting to argue is that bullying operates in the social context of the organisation and understanding the role played by other people in the organisation who may come to know about, oversee, overhear bullying behaviours. We need to understand their behaviour and identify how to change their behaviour through interventions in order to be successful. So I'm going to now introduce our next exercise, which builds on these ideas, um, which is thinking about those other people in the organisation and the role they play. And we're going to call those people bystanders. So what we're going to do is we're going to split you into some small breakout rooms and each breakout room is going to have a facilitator. The facilitator is going to share a scenario with you and give you a couple of minutes to read through that scenario and then there are three questions that we've attached to the scenario that you're going to be discussing. Um, your facilitator has been asked to take some basic notes during the discussions and then we'll ask you to nominate someone to feedback on the exercise when we come back. So we're going to give you about 10 minutes in the breakout room and can we allocate people to the rooms now is that okay? So what we want to do now is essentially get a bit of feedback from that exercise and see what people think. Um, so Cara, I'm just gonna ask you to be my timer and just check that we're doing okay timing wise. I've just had a quick check and it looks like we're doing great, which is, which is good. So we've got some time to really just hear about what the groups talked about. Now, if you're anything like my group, we got, um, we got just about up to the third question. We didn't really get to discuss it in depth and we didn't really allocate um, um, someone to feedback. So don't worry if that's not happened. I think the default will be for the facilitators to feedback if it hasn't been discussed already. Um, but in any groups where someone's volunteered, obviously, please go ahead. So I don't know if anyone remembers what group number they were in. I think I was in group number two. Um, so what about group number I think we were in group, I think I was in group one and I said I'd do the feedback. Yeah, lovely, that would be great. Okay. Um, so, so we didn't have a facilitator in our group. So um, we, we lost a little bit of time at the start, just trying to work out what was happening. So we started talking about bullying anyway within organisations. Um, so we were talking about the example that you shared about Linus. Um, and we were saying that um, in the survey at the start, there was quite a low percentage felt that bullying was dealt with well within their organisation. We said that was quite interesting. And we were saying quite often it can be because of the power dynamic that it is um, managers or senior leaders who might be accused of perpetuating the bullying. And quite often organisations move to protect the senior leaders, the managers, etc. So like the example you gave, the answer was to put in a software solution which doesn't address his behaviour, because if he's doing that in emails, how's he behaving with individuals? That is really not appropriate. Um, but then we were saying around the fact that it's quite difficult tackling that, and you need the whole organisation to be prepared to, to um, take on 
it needs a whole cultural shift because it can be quite often the instigators of the organisation, the organisation set it up. Um, and then Lindsay did join us and did share the um, example. So we didn't, like I say, fortunately we didn't really get into that, but that it looks like it would have been a really interesting one to start talking about. So I was so that's sorry what, for that confusion in our group. Um, okay, so I think we were group number two. Does that sound right to my group? Um, so unless anyone has a burning desire to, um, I might as well summarise what we talked about in our group, if that's okay. So we, we talked about that first question, how should people respond in the case of this scenario where Alex is obviously being marginalised and um, by the group. Um, and there was consent that we this is something that needs to be discussed in some way and it needs to be acknowledged. Um, we kind of, we weren't sure about whether this should be discussed with or without Alex there, because, you know, it's quite a complex and, and very sensitive situation, but there needs to be some acknowledgement of the fact that this behavior, behavior is happening and it probably isn't in line with the team's values and the company's values and so on. In terms of how people actually respond, um, it's quite different in terms of you know people's experiences. So some people deny the existence of such issues, ignore it. Um, some people join in because they want to belong, you know, fit in with the team culture, you, you know, or behaviour becomes so normative essentially. Um, but there are likely to be some differences between different industries or different teams, potentially depending on the tone set by the leader. Um, and the final question we didn't get in depth on, but one of the points that came out that was really interesting is that when we thought about what effects different behaviours might have, when we thought about the kind of behaviours that we've said people should do, like, you know, calling the issue out, acknowledging it, we, we were thinking that actually it might be kind of embarrassing for Alex, you know, if an issue is raised on their behalf without prior consent and there's also possible danger in terms of antagonizing the team so that was our discussion so someone's very helpful oh, abby thank you so much so group three if we pass over so i think cara was the facilitator um would you like to give back someone um yes yeah, so just like us just like uh your group karen we didn't have enough time to nominate anyone um so unless anyone wants to volunteer i'm happy to just read through some of the notes Yep. Okay. I have not no, not from Robert. So yeah, we also kind of talked about you know whether or not we wanted to include Alex in the situation because it might be quite embarrassing for him, or we don't want to come up across as quite patronizing um, because they might act because you know perhaps Alex might prefer to be alone or prefer their current way of working. But mainly we talked about you know ideally people would try to mediate situations, try to understand why your colleagues are acting this way, why they think, what thoughts they have towards Alex. We also talked about creating team events where everyone is invited to try and kind of gain, foster that team spirit. But we also acknowledge that people, we can create these formal events, but the informal culture. So everyone just having these natural friendships is very, very difficult mm -hmm. to manage, or even if it's or probably not right to manage in some way. We also talked about maybe kind of subtly forcing gossip to be heard. So if someone's saying something negative to Alex, we can say, you know, oh, I didn't hear you there. Could you just repeat yourself to kind of put them on the spot? So those were the ideal situations. But re in reality, we kind of agreed with what the other group said, that people would generally keep to themselves, ignore it, pretend they haven't heard it or hope it goes away. We, may, we also talked about the possibility of people who just don't know what to do, especially if the bully is a very like popular person or has some sort of power. You may end up backing these negative behaviors up to show that you're on their side. And obviously, you know, this would make things more difficult. Yeah, people, and as Flora Jane said, people try not to lose their jobs or get involved mm -hmm. either. So they may be afraid for their own well being. And this obviously would you know, um, widen the gulf between Alex and the perpetrators, lead to escalations, the behavior is getting worse, and it just create a really not pleasant atmosphere for the team. I Thank you so really much. Yeah. So if we go on to group four now, so I believe Jean was the facilitator. Yes, it's me. Just let me fiddle and try and get the, um, my notes up. Right, okay. Um, 
uh, lots of consistency with what other groups have said. The questions, how do you think people should respond? And we'd uh, put down, challenge the quiet remarks made at the meeting, but perhaps after the meeting, uh, and actually challenging the makers of the comments. Um, after the meeting, ask if Alex is okay. Uh, but it might be focused initially on the issues of the contribution to the project, why he hadn't done what he was supposed to do. Uh, but also his behave the the behavior needs challenging of the people making the remarks but also checking about the well-being of Alex so um, did he hear the remarks and how did they feel that could be done in the kind of form of an open question so how did you feel the meeting went so um, dealing with it sensitively there um, and try to break down the barriers to and, and bring Alex into the fold really and that's the manager's responsibility. In terms of how people actually responded, uh, do nothing, ignore it uh, or just recognise the operational aspect um, of Alex's failures but not deal with the wider issues. Um, we put down that there were issues of uh, with behaviour of people speculating outside of the meeting, not including him in more sort of social activities and commenting on his personal life. So why was this going on? Are there wider issues with Alex and his colleagues um, outside of direct workplace activity? Was there an exclusion of Alex? Is there a history? Is he new? Why is this going on? Also peer pressure not to respond, particularly if all the groups share the same views, um, uh, insiders and outsiders. Uh, it can be hard to challenge, I need to think about strategies for doing so, and if um, the in-group challenge, they may risk self-alienation um, if they did stand up to their um, peers in the group. Finally, we were running out of time too, um, but the effects would be adverse for Alex. Um, uh, it should be tackled or it will escalate. Um, it's also not good for the team overall long term. Divisions within teams are unhelpful. And that's our that's our contribution. Thank you. Thank you so much. Some really interesting points there. So can I pass to Julia now from group five, please? Yeah. Uh, so there is lots of consistency with what you said before. Uh, for question one, we really said someone made it an interesting point said that everyone could make mistakes so such as like this and maybe say something that is inappropriate uh, but first and foremost that should be like company policy and company behavior that people should not treat people in this way and uh, of course the opinion was that we uh, people would never allow to have this kind of behavior in a meeting it's a professional space and it's not correct towards other people and it's not productive towards the team as well and for what, how actually people should respond. It really also depends on who's chairing the meeting and the type of person that we have in there because everyone is different. Um, we believe that uh, a company that uh, um, allows this uh, does not have a good culture, does not have a good environment. And uh, in the reality, people majority of the times they just really ignore this kind of issues and uh, because they, they might not even realize the impact this might have on people but um, on the other side this is what is what might happen most of the time it's but you know um, on the other side people should really show support and be supportive if something like that happens to any colleague uh, for the last question um, we said that the person who is in charge the manager whoever should be the one who mitigates and helps uh, facilitate uh, this kind of conversation maybe through mediation or any facilitating conversation really and uh, because uh, what if Alex uh, was her, was hearing all the other comments that his colleagues were saying outside that meeting he would have felt so hurt and he probably would have left the company and we said from if we were everyone in Alex's perspective he probably would have wanted to leave uh, just because of that and have a very negative impact on your work experience and um, that also uh, this kind of responses can be very negative not only for Alex in this case but for all the team on a wider scale and people need to be very resilient about this. Thank you again some really interesting points coming out of that group um, so we're going to pass to the final group which was facilitated by Carol. Ah yes thank you so again lots of consistency um, 
what did we say? We talked about how people might respond in terms of perhaps having um, an induction that included work buddies to help people feel like they do fit in to make a more inclusive culture. Um, we felt it was a manager's responsibility to discuss the oversight, not the team. So the team shouldn't do that. And we felt it was important to create a culture where people could speak up. Um, so go gossiping behaviours are both challenged and challenged without fear of repercussion. So that was that very open culture. In reality, we felt there was unlikely to be open challenge. And we it was a nice term. I liked it. It wasn't mine called kitchen conversations. You know, those people go on and have these conversations behind each other's back in the absence of challenge. And that the situation is like to snowball. Lots of people will, will do nothing. Addicts will continue to suffer, to miss out on opportunities. And then kind of two leading into three was this idea of conflict and escalation, the arrow that I think it was Cara showed, ultimately then leading into Alex's position potentially becoming untenable and he may leave or certainly suffer. We thought the manager would also face difficulties, might not have the necessary skills, for example, to deal with what is quite a um, difficult situation. Um, a sensitive situation and we also thought the perpetrators might for example face investigations um, and come under you know, negative scrutiny so again that, that idea of the team suffering and stamping it out or challenging it at an early stage might be um, might be the, the best way forward and and, the, and not doing that would have all these negative repercussions on a range of people Thank you again. So what's very interesting is that I think there's so much commonality between the groups in terms of particularly this real division between what people should do versus what people actually do. So I've, I'm going to ask the facilitators for um, them to email Cara and I afterwards, please, with the notes that you've taken. We're going to compile that for the feedback that we give um, down the line. Um, but for now, I'm gonna pass back to Cara to talk more about bystanders and what we know about their behavior. Thank you, Karen. So I'll set up the screen sharing right now, but I just wanted to bring up a really interesting point that Carol raised about the perpetrator's point of view. And that's something that tends to be ignored when we try to handle a bullying situation. I've read some really interesting papers about how the effects of being accused of bullying are actually similar to the effects of being bullied. So people like, you know, um, accused perpetrators end up experiencing depression and all these negative mental and physical effects. And it's something that should also be taken into account even if it's quite morally difficult in organizations. So that's just my little nerding out bit, but I will share my screen right now and then we will get back to we'll get back to the presentation. Great. Okay, so from our discussion and from the from your from the breakout rooms, hopefully you'll have an idea of how important it is to acknowledge bullying as a social process. So not only from its development but to its escalation, bullying actually involves more than just the target and the perpetrator. However, researchers and practitioners have tended to focus on these two people, which makes sense given that this is where the crux of the harm occurs and where action is most easily taken. However, it's important to think about the wider team or the wider organization, especially if they can act as a silent majority. So there have been many reports in, many reports and studies showing that a, that in many organizations a wide like a large number of employees have reported witnessing bullying at some point in their careers so this number can range from 30 percent all the way to 80 almost 90 percent um, in certain sectors so i think healthcare reported the highest number of witnessed incidents and this brings into this brings into question the idea of bullying being simply a two-person problem when it occurs in front of other people. And in the past few years, there's been a push towards a new understanding of these third-party bystanders, moving from a silent, passive, um, passive kind of formless mass to portraying them as empowered, active agents who have the ability to affect the course of bullying for the better or for the worse. And this all, whenever I give a presentation about the power of bystanders, 
I think it really resonates with some people. So I've had people come up to me after talks I've given and kind of say, you know, I've been bullied in my organization before. And if people had spoken up in this constructive way, I think it would make things a lot better. And it really highlights the importance of the social context. So how do we understand the different types of bystanders that are possible? The different, um, the bystanders who can worsen bullying or improve it. So from that, we're going, so to answer that, I'm going to introduce um, a framework that was developed by some colleagues in Australia, I think in Perth. And um, this framework has served as the basis for a lot of research that Karen and I have done. So what, um, so what, this framework does is categorize bystanders along two dimensions, which are listed below. So they say that um, bystanders can behave in an active or passive way. So whether or not they're proactive, so their behaviors are directed towards the bullying situation, or if they do nothing, remain passive and ignore. Some people may argue that passivity may not be such a big issue because it's the lack of action. However, research has shown that when interviewing witnesses, when interviewing targets, passive responses agreeing with bullying, you know, that you don't notice anything wrong, and that can be just as damaging to, um, to targets. So we have the active and passive dimension, and the second dimension is constructive and destructive. So this is the extent to which behaviors seek to improve the bullying situation in the case of constructive responses. So this can be like, you know, the, the should, the should behaviors that we discussed in our, that we discussed in our, um, in our groups. So like approaching the bullies, reporting incidents to line manager, maybe approaching Alex, um, anything that seeks to try to resolve or improve the situation. On the other side, we have destructive behaviors, which are bystander responses that seek to worsen the bullying situation. And this can be, as we've discussed in, a, in the breakout rooms, you know, taking sides with the perpetrator, laughing along with jokes, or um, just simply doing nothing, ignoring the situation and hoping it goes away, which can, as you can imagine, further harm the, um, the target. And so I'll, in our next slide, I'll give you a figure to, that'll help you better visualize this um, framework. A lot of research that Karen and I have done is based off this. And we found that constructive responses can actually have a buffering effect on, the, um, on bullying's harm. So we conducted a, a study on, um, with a Norwegian colleague in a Dutch university and found that in groups where there are more active constructive bystanders, so those that seek to proactively address the bullying, um, targets reported, uh, reported less negative outcomes. So that really shows you the power that bystanders can have. So from this, taking this framework and applying it into practice, we need to emphasize the importance of having standard intervention early on in the bullying process before the situation escalates to the target being very, very affected or the bullying becoming more and more aggressive. This, so, and it's also important to take these, um, to encourage active responses before group norms are set, before these sort of harmful behaviors are normalized and not seen as out of the ordinary. Um, so there are several ways to do this. Uh, some people are, some researchers argue that it's important to, to train in perspective taking. I like Karen's cat. And um, so uh, to maybe do perspective taking training and learning to take, um, to adopt targets perspectives and understanding their point of view, which will help facilitate or encourage active responses. And there are many interventions that try to encourage responses in bullying research and sexual harassment and discrimination research. So moving on, here is a figure that um, helps visual that helps you visualize the framework that I was just talking about. So on the top, so on the kind of X vertical axis, you have, sorry, on the Y vertical axis, you have active and passive responses. So the extent to which behaviors are proactive. And then you have horizontally, destructive, and constructive. So you have, so you can categorize these two dimensions into four types of responses. So you have active destructive, which are responses that I guess 
really seek to make the bullying situation worse. So it's that laughing along, actively joining in with the perpetrator. And then you have passive constructive on the bottom. So these are behaviors that are not necessarily inactive, but they do worsen the situation. So this, we normally categorize this as maybe ignoring the situation, leaving the room when you see the target and the perpetrator together, just things that show a lack of maybe apathy or a lack of action. On the right side, we have more constructive the bottom right, we have passive constructive behaviors. So these don't directly address the bullying, but seek to maybe make the situation better through maybe comforting the target or listening to the target if they want to share their, share their feelings. On the top right, we have the ideal situation, the ideal types of behaviors, and these are active constructive behaviors. So those so responses, that are proactive and seek to challenge maybe the, the negative behaviors and improve the situation for the target. So reporting incidents, challenging perpetrators. And these are the behaviors we want to encourage. And what I'd like to do right now is actually open up, um, open up, the, open up for discussion um, and to ask people, ask everyone, what are the barriers um, that are standing in the way of people enacting these active constructive behaviors. So these are the behaviors that we want to happen, but why don't they happen in the real world? We've touched upon this in our last discussion, but it'd be really interesting to hear, to hear people's points of view. So I might stop sharing the screen so I can kind of see everyone in the, in the chat, if that's okay. So I think Joanna, um, uh, so there are a few responses about um, how being, being, a, being a target yourself, a fear of reprisals if um, maybe the targets um, or if the perpetrators find out that you've been the one reporting, that might be, that might be something stopping people. I think Paula said, um, it's very hard for middle and junior bystanders to tackle long senior long tenured leadership bullying. Yeah, so the power dynamic might make it quite difficult, especially if you're in um, a quote unquote inferior position where your job is more at stake. Yep, so lots of really, really good, lots of re really, really good um, comments in the chat. Does anyone want to kind of speak up and, uh, uh, and join the, maybe like uh, share their conversation, their thoughts verbally, just to kind of facilitate facilitate a discussion? Yeah, I think it's, sorry, here is Paula. Hi, Paula. Hi, hi. I just think it's, it's, um, let me just see if I can put the, just make it a little bit easier. <laughs> Hello. Uh, and I don't know. Um, I, um, I think it's incredibly difficult for um, junior and middle, junior staff and middle management to actually submit a grievance against a long tenure member of the senior leadership team, for example. I've seen it time and time and time and time again. So that's why I bring it up, unless they want to place themselves at risk of, of losing their jobs. And that's what usually ends up happening, unfortunately. Uh, there's a lot of passive aggressiveness. You know, who do you submit the, the grievance to? You know, yeah. to the senior leadership member that actually normalizes that. I mean, what are they going to do? They're going to say, well, if you don't like it, you have to leave. Um, and that's the reality of it. It takes a very mature senior leadership to implement a mechanism, a process where people feel psychologically safe. Definitely. To actually you know, discuss the things and submit a grievance and, and reach um, a solution for everybody, you know, and, and not having any reprisals or, or, or anything like that. I personally, unfortunately, have not seen that happening um, in the workplace. Um, and I've worked for a very long time. Um, so if anybody has a, a different experience uh, from the same or a different industry, I'd love to hear it. Thank you, Paula. So 
two really interesting points about the power dynamic and the insecurity of the insecurity of employment or fear of losing your job. And that seems to be echoed in the chat as well. Um, and Joanna agrees. In fact, um, even when people have no choice but to leave because they say, well, you know, nobody's going to listen to me. And then they decide to find themselves another job, resign, go and work somewhere else. And in the leaving letter, they actually outline what happened and why they resign. So it's not for financial reasons or for the promotion somewhere else. It's because they just could not take it anymore. Um, I've seen the senior leadership just shrugging their shoulders, putting that letter into the former employee's personal file, and they're not doing anything about it, knowing full well from various different people that those issues actually do exist, but they just don't do anything. Yeah, no, the, there seems to be a theme of um, the importance of having senior leadership that encourages um, constructive intervention without sort of penalties or fear of reprisals. That's very true. Are there any other are there any other thoughts about what stops people from from intervening? Um, so I think Kieran wrote that. Um, Organizations invest more in creating policies that identify bullying behaviors, but less on educating staff on how to tackle them in a safe and compassionate way. So that's definitely true. Thank you, Kieran. I think a lot of times, perhaps these policies may be a tick, a tick box exercise to show that they have these behaviors, that, I'm sorry, these policies in place, but following up and evaluating whether or not they're effective is a completely different story. Um, Yes. Oh, uh, Kaylin asks, does research data show which types of workers encounter bullying more? That actually is quite interesting. I'm not sure if a lot of research does look into this, but I would imagine that temporary workers may be more susceptible given the power dynamics. Karen, do you, are you aware of any? I feel like there is something on um, certain sectors. There are, I mean, there yeah. are differences between sectors, and I feel like people in lower paid professions do tend to be more likely to be exposed to these behaviours. Um, I'm not sure there is something about temporary contracts and so on that, that makes people more likely to be exposed. I'm thinking, I'm thinking back to the lecture I did for our MSc students last year, and I feel I'm fairly certain I included something on this. Um, so I think it's like precarious work um, and exposure to bullying. I'm sure there's some sort of link there, but I'd definitely have to do a bit more research to confirm that. Yeah, they're definitely, and this might be just an area of research that we've not really focused on as a community. So it's something that might be interesting going forward. And yes, I agree, Paula, that anti-bullying harassment intervention should be more than an online course. There needs to be more investment in time and money on this. So yeah, so just moving on to our final question, I'm just curious, you know, what do you think organizations can do to encourage these kind of constructive responses? So maybe um, we talked about senior leadership playing an important role, interventions being more than just tick box exercise. What else do you think organizations can do? Yep, so all staff attendance on interactive workshops. So are you talking about maybe compulsory attendance on these on these things? Uh, yes, Cara. Um, as a provider of this type of work, I'm not going to start unless there's a senior bod that leads it and is committed to it and launches it. Otherwise, it's not going to work. And yeah, it's mandatory time. We don't use the word mandatory because uh, people don't like it. But um, <laughs> if you're going to normalize the culture to make it acceptable to challenge one another and to understand how to do that in a respectful way, then uh, it needs to be everyone attendance. Otherwise, it's not going to work. Definitely. So the importance of having the senior managed, senior, senior leadership buy in. Yep. Yeah. And I think Kaylin as well has echoed that. Um, I think. I think just the overriding thing is having training and guidance, as, say, as Sylvie pointed out. Um, does anyone else have any thoughts about what companies can do? 
perhaps maybe ensuring anonymity and confidentiality. So we talked a lot about fear of reprisals and fear of losing your job if you do report. So maybe having pol pol policies that emphasize this safety from whistleblowing reprisals would be useful. Obviously it's, it's an ideal type of thing, but having policies that are regularly evaluated um, may be helpful. Is there anything else? Team respect charters. I've never heard of that. Um, do you, I, I don't want to pick on you, Robert, but do you want to elaborate? Yeah, if, you, if you're if you not going to get a whole organizational buy-in, but you've at least got that of a senior person and the people within their team, then to undertake an understanding of what we need of each other to feel respected and uh, what's acceptable and unacceptable, get that written down. Yeah. Bring it about as a team-based respect charter. But then, a team developed one. Yeah, then at least our patch is in a happier place if you can't extend that organizationally wide. Yeah, I guess focus on your immediate surroundings. Yeah. I, rem I remember being in a, doing a focus group a couple of years ago and someone was saying you to create an oasis of safety. I liked that, I like that analogy. Um, and I think Joanna, she says, you know, creating safe channels and safe, Flora Jane says safe, Zones. Do you want to elaborate on that, Joanna? Yep, yeah, sure. Hi, everyone. Um, yeah, so I think what you were saying about creating the safe spaces where people can actually identify things that are happening with the organization um, and there's no fear of retribution, I think that's such an important thing. And I know that the NHS have got something, I don't know if I've called them the right thing, actually. I've said speak up guardians. It's something along those lines. Um, but something like that, where, you know, there's individuals who you could, maybe you don't approach in person, because again, that's going to be quite difficult. Um, but maybe you can just message them through the safe channel um, and raise a concern whether it's for yourself or for somebody else and then get support and get signposted to whatever needs to be done but I think it is an entire organizational thing um, yeah. and I think it's within the design it's within relationships it's such a massive issue um, and yeah I'd, it's, it's been a great session as well so thank you. Oh, thank you all. Um, yeah, thank you for your, thank you for sharing. Sorry for just picking on you. I just thought it was a very nice, very nice comment. Um, building on that, I just, I think it's important maybe to have colleagues who are these speak up guardians or confidential, or, you know, well-being champions, as it may make reporting more approachable rather than going straight to a supervisor or someone who you may not know very well. I think it's important to have that as well. Yes, confidential advisors. Yes, definitely. So does anyone have anything else to add? If not, I think we are good to, I think um, it'd be nice to wrap up. Yep, I got the nod from Karen, so I will go back to sharing my screen. Okay, hopefully this works. Yes, so to wrap up, um, so hopefully by the end of this, at, at the end of the session, you'll have an idea of why bystanders are an important missing part in our kind of puzzle to try and understand and solve or, or tackle workplace bullying. And that by, by focusing on bystanders, you, I think we'll be able to empower colleagues within organizations to try and improve bullying situations when they encounter them. And Following on from our discussion on training, on the importance of training, we will be giving a session summary after, shortly after this, after this session is over, where we'll talk about key points from our slides and we'll try, I'll, I'll at least try to answer some of the questions that were submitted in the sign up um, that we weren't able to get to. And what we'd also like to do is um, give you a, a one paper on potential um, potential opportunities for collaboration. So what Karen and I are doing is developing a bystander training program. So there are, haven't been many that are have been academically or scientifically developed and evaluated that target that look at workplace bullying specifically. And what we'd like to do is partner with an organization or several organizations to help to co-produce an effective bystander training program. So we'll have some more, 
um, in the in the leaflet that will come with the session. So we'll have our contact information and some more info and some more detail on what exactly we're looking for. We're also interested in maybe working with organizations to conduct research on how bystander responses can affect target well-being. So we mentioned a bit about this earlier on, about how active constructive responses can buffer harm. We want to explore further and to gain a deeper understanding of this. So um, if you're interested in that, please be on the lookout for, um, for our session summary. And this is our contact information. Thank you very much for your time. Apologies for the tech issues early on, but thank you for your time, especially during lunch. And I will hand over to Carol, who will wrap up the session. Thanks, Cara. So really, it's just for me to thank both, well, mainly Cara and Karen for a fascinating session, but also AMBS for working in conjunction with the CIPD's Fellows Forum to deliver this. I, I can see from the comments at the side that it's been a really valuable and really interesting session. Uh, and, and we've all learned a lot from that. So many thanks to you. We do have resources. I know some people have popped some of those in the chat box, but you can see the CIPD resources, just an example of those there. And then also to draw your attention to upcoming CIPD events. We're wholly online until Christmas. After Christmas, we hope to do some more face-to-face, -face, but there is the link there to the Manchester branch website ethical leadership which I think has a lot of resonance with some of the issues that we've discussed today uh, we're running a session on that next week and the following week recruitment and what's happening post-covid there's always lots going on in the Manchester branch so if you check that link you'll find out um, all the things that we have on offer and our next uh, fellows forum event in conjunction with AMBS will be in the spring so if you keep a lookout for that you'll find details of that before very long um, otherwise just thank you for your time we really appreciate uh, your input, your attendance, and, and your support. Um, and I wish you a lovely rest of the day. Goodbye, everybody.